Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, we happen to be going through the Bible, and we are back in the Old Testament. So turn, or as J. Barton Payne used to say, the Older Testament. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Now, I've had you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 1, and as you do, it's only fitting that I begin somewhere else. <laughs> just because I'm like that, you know. Um, as you get ready, just listen to this. This is right out of Psalm 78. It's a lengthy psalm written by Asaph as he is poetically speaking about the history of his people, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, from the time of their captivity in Egypt, their deliverance from Egypt through the wilderness, all the way up to the monarchy under King David. He basically is saying, even though the Jewish people were repeatedly unfaithful, God himself was faithful, and he made some promises, and he kept them. So in Psalm 78, I'm beginning in verse 68, it says that, that God chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has established forever. He also chose David, his servant. He took him from the sheep folds, from following the ewes that had young. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. I wanted to begin there because 2 Samuel has as its main theme the rise of David. From his obscurity, that was really 1 Samuel, on now into 2 Samuel, his rise to be the king over the nation. The psalmist says that God took him from the sheepfold. You know, David was the overlooked kid in the family. He was considered the runt of the litter. He was outside keeping the sheep. His dad, Jesse, didn't even think when the prophet Samuel said, bring all your boys in, I want to have a look at them, and we're going to have a little prayer meeting, I'm going to anoint the next king of Israel. Jesse didn't even think that bringing David in among his sons was important because, after all, he just dismissed the idea that his son David could ever be the king of anything, let alone the nation. And so he didn't even bring him in. He was overlooked, but that is the one that God chose. In fact, twice in the Bible, David is called a man after God's own heart. Now that's quite a title because if, if you think about it, no one else has been called a man or a woman after God's own heart in the Bible, but David was. Now that strikes those of us who know the life of David very well, that strikes us a bit odd because David was far from perfect. I mean, he had he wasn't Superman, and certainly David had his own kryptonite. Uh, he had a problem with women that brought him down and got him into trouble. But when it says he's a man after God's own heart, the John Knox translation of the Old Testament said he was a man after God's purposes. He was somebody who was following the purpose of God Though far from perfect, though he fell and um, foiled and fumbled, 
He was still a man who was after the purposes of God in his life and for the nation. And the Bible places a huge emphasis on David for the simple reason that as the story goes on, somebody from his lineage, somebody who will be called the son of David, the offspring of David, named Jesus Christ, won't be the king of just a earthly kingdom, but he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So you would expect, because of that, because of the tie-in of the ultimate son of David in the future, both fulfilled in the New Testament and from our vantage point in the future, you would expect a huge amount of verbal real estate to be dedicated to David, and you would be right. If you were to tally up the number of chapters devoted to Abraham, you'd only count 14. He's the father of all those who believe. 14 chapters are devoted to Abraham. To Joseph, 12 chapters. To Jacob, 11 chapters. To the prophet Elijah, the greatest Old Testament prophet, 11 chapters. When it comes to King David, or David, 62 chapters in the Bible are devoted to him. 1,118 verses mention his name. In fact, his name is mentioned more than all the others, and the only other name mentioned more frequently is the name of Jesus. So David occupies a huge place, and that's why I think it's important for us as Bible believers to understand not just the New Testament, but the background of the New Testament, the Old Testament. This is why we go through the Bible, because the Bible that Jesus read from and Paul read from and all of the New Testament guys and gals read from was the Old Testament. And they would have known these scriptures that you and I are going to be studying. So that's the introduction from Psalm 78, and we hope to get through chapter 1 or chapter 1 and 2, uh, oh, you laughed. <laughs> but you have a right to, I suppose. Now, at, as, at the point in which we open up the book of 2 Samuel, a group of people known as the Philistines, you've heard of the Philistines, bad guys. They have, there's been an incursion by the Philistines on the land for a number of years, and by 2 Samuel chapter 1, they have just increased in strength and in land because they just defeated the nation of Israel under King Saul in a battle that took place up north. That's where we left off in 1 Samuel. I don't expect all of you to remember that because we didn't go from 1 to 2 Samuel. Well, we're going from Old to New Testament back to Old. So we did 1 Corinthians and now we're back. But the battle has just taken place. David wanted to go to that battle. He was kept back from the battle by Achish, the king of the Philistines, because the lord of the Philistines said, hey, Achish, um, we're Philistines. We're going to go fight the Israelites. Saul is uh, the, the king of Israel. I know that David and Saul have, have had a falling out, but you also know David is very loyal to Saul and keeps referring to him as the Lord's anointed, it could be that if David comes with us to fight against the Israelites, that mid-battle he's going to turn on us and fight against us. So the lords of the Philistines put up a big hoopla. Achish said, sorry, Dave, you can't go to battle with us. You have to go back home. So David goes back home. His home at this time is way down south in a town called Ziklag, a town that was given to him. Um, and he has been gone from it because he wanted to go up north to the battle. He's been turned away, so he goes back home. And if you recall, when he goes back home, a group of invaders called Amalekites came in, stole 
These men's families, their wives, their children, burned down their city with fire, stole all their goods, because that's the sort of people the Amalekites were. And I'm going to explain that because there's a very important thing God says about the Amalekites, and unless you know that that has been their ongoing historical narrative, it will be very difficult for you to understand it. So that, that is how the book opens up. Uh, the Philistines are um, large and in charge, and uh, Saul has been the king. Saul is now dead because of that battle at Mount Gilboa which sets up David to be the next king, though he's not going to be the next king of Israel immediately, as we are going to see. But we begin with these words. Now it came to pass, after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, those were the people that raided his town, stole his wives and children, as well as the rest of the army's families, and David stayed two days in Ziklag. So they're just now getting over that attack. On the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, where have you come from? And so he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And the young man who told him said, As it happened by chance, or as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, now I don't believe he was there by chance. I believe he was there by design. And I'm going to tell you why in, in a moment. If I don't, remind me. I was there by chance to be on Mount Goboa. There was Saul, leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him and he saw me, and he called to me, and I answered, Here I am. So he must have said, Hey, you. And the Amalekite said, Yeah, here I am, over here. And he said, Who are you? So I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. And he said to me again, please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head, the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them here to my Lord. Now we have a contradiction. Just reading these verses, we have a contradiction in the story. Because if we read the previous chapter, which is the last chapter of 1 Samuel, which tells us the story, Israel is fighting the battle against the Philistines. Saul and his sons are on top of Mount Gilboa. While Jonathan and Saul are in pursuit or running from the Philistines, either way, an arrow of the Philistines is launched. It happens to strike Saul and wound him. It didn't kill him, but it wounded him so much that Saul knew he wasn't going to make it, that he was going to die a slow death. So he turned to his armor bearer, his staff member, and he said, look, uh, as you can see, I got, I got the point. I have an arrow in me. I'm going to die. Do me the service of taking your sword and thrusting it through and killing me. Well, the armor bearer didn't want to do it. He was very hesitant to do so. It's the king, after all, so he just sort of hemmed and hawed. 
And so the text says that Saul took his own lance and he thrust himself or fell upon it and he died. Now we have an Amalekite saying, yeah, I was there and he wasn't dead and so he told me to kill him and I killed him. So we have a couple of options. Either um, Saul's attempted suicide was unsuccessful. So he got an arrow. It was a bad wound. He knew he was going to bleed to death. He had his armor bearer do it. Armor bearer wouldn't do it. So he fell on his sword or lance sword and killed himself. But it was a failed attempt, by the way. The majority, even to this day, of suicide attempts um, are, are a failure. They do not succeed. Um, and there's suffering that goes with that. Here was a suicide attempt by Saul that was unsuccessful, perhaps. And so the Amalekite just happened to be there. And uh, he said, look, you know, I got an arrow. I tried to kill myself. It didn't work. Would you just put me out of my misery? According to the Amalekite, that's what happened. But that's according to the Amalekite. I don't believe his assessment. I tend to believe the record before it, which is simply a narrative, a historical narrative of how he died. Now you have somebody giving another story, and why is he doing it? Because he brings the crown or the gold band that was around the helmet of Saul and the wristband that designated that he was a soldier, but he was the king of the nation. And he brings them back to David, hoping that David is going to reward him monetarily. Now, a word about the Amalekites, just so you have the background. The Amalekites were an enemy of the Jewish people from the early days when they came out of Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, a couple million people going across the Red Sea and into the land, it says that the Amalekites attacked the rear ranks, the people who were old, infirmed, or the feeble and the weak, those are the ones that the Amalekites attacked so they could steal their supplies. So really, they were a group of terrorists. That's all they were, is terrorists. And they were known for this throughout their history. They even bred that in their children, generation after generation, uh, to find a battle. And when people died on the battlefields and they would move on to the next battlefield, those who were slain on that battlefield, the Amalekites would go strip the body of clothing, of jewelry, of all possessions, and then take it and sell it. And that's how they, that's how they lived. So when David is up at Ziklag, or uh, up at, uh, in the battle, and he leaves, li- leaves his town Ziklag, the Amalekites are there, it's unprotected, let's raid it, let's rob it, let's loot it, let's take these people and sell them as slaves. That's what they were wont to do. That is part of their history. And because of that, God gave a commandment to Moses saying, tell the children of Israel and make sure that Joshua hears this in his ears as well, that once you've entered the land and you've settled down and you're at peace, you have a score to settle. I want you to blot out the name of the Amalekites once and for all. Because of this deeply seated and generationally taught way of of terrorizing nations. So we fast forward when Saul was the king. And Samuel the prophet came up to him and said, Thus says the Lord, this is chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, chapter 15. Thus says the Lord, Saul, just like God told Moses to settle the score, you're the man to do it. Attack the Amalekites. Spare no one. And people have found fault with God because he gave such a brutal commandment. You have to understand who the Amalekites were, what their practices were, how they taught their children this from generation to generation. And the Lord said, you're going to have trouble with the Amalekites from generation to generation if you don't do this. So, you know the story. King Saul goes out, fights against the Amalekites, comes back, spares King Agag and some of the best of the flocks. He comes back home and Samuel the prophet approaches him and says, 
what are you doing? And Saul says, what do you mean, what am I doing? Praise the Lord, I've obeyed the commandment of God. The prophet Samuel said, really? If you were so obedient to the Lord, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep in my ears? Sounds like a Malachite sheep to me. Oh, well, I brought a few animals back to, you know, sacrifice to the Lord. And he brought King Agag and spared several of the Amalekites, several of them, probably for his own purposes. And you also know that Samuel the prophet took his sword out and approached Agag, and the Bible says, hacked him in pieces. You say, well, that's horrible. Yeah, it's pretty brutal, but keep, fa- keep reading and read the Jewish story of the children of Israel being captives in Persia in the book of Esther when a man named Haman, who was an Agagite, a descendant of King Agag, the Amalekite, succeeded in forming a law that would exterminate all of the Jewish people in the entire kingdom of Persia. If Saul would have been obedient to the command of God, none of that would have happened. So David, just fresh off of fighting the Amalekites, sees this young Amalekite come into the camp saying, hey dude, you know, I'm an Amalekite. I just happened to be on Mount Gilboa. Amalekites didn't happen to be anywhere. They were a warring tribe who were looking for battles and would always go to battlefields to strip the slain. So when he comes up with this story, David says, I know you guys, I just fought your whole gang and you're telling me this story. So he's listening to him, he's questioning him on it. David, it says, took hold of his own clothes and tore them, verse 11, and so did all the men who were with him And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And then David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien in Amalekai. David said to him, How was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Now, before we even finish this story, let me just say that I see David ripping his clothes and mourning and and really calling his 600 men to a, a public display of mourning. I see it as a sign, a mark, a signal of David's greatness. And I say that because Saul was his enemy. Saul made David a fugitive for no less than 10 years. He chased David around the country for 10 years, and Saul tried to kill David. But David, instead of saying, ding dong, the witch is dead. Which old witch? The wicked witch. He mourned. He tore his clothes as a display, and he felt brokenhearted. He still had respect for King Saul, no matter what Saul did. You remember that. He always called him the Lord's anointed. Remember the story when David was down in En Gedi, and Saul needed to use the restroom, and so he left his men behind and went into a cave, not knowing that as he walked into the restroom, there were 600 men in the shadows of that restroom. It was David and the army, and his buddy elbowed him and said, David, this is the Lord, man. He has delivered Saul into your hands. Take this knife and cut his throat. David said, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And so David had already been anointed by God privately by King, by, by the prophet Samuel. Jonathan knew that David was the next king. Samuel knew David was the next king. Several people in Israel knew David was the next king. But David figured this. If the Lord allowed Saul to be the king, or put it another way, if God put the crown on Saul's head, 
then God's going to have to take the crown off Saul's head. He's going to be the Lord's anointed until God does it, not me. I'm not going to be the instrument that ends his life. If I'm the next one, great. If I'm not, I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And so he was very respectful of Saul and Jonathan, his son. Remember, Jonathan and David were knit together. It says their souls were knit together. It broke his heart to hear that word. So we continue the story. By the way, I just can't resist this. So that's David weeping over the enemy who wanted to kill him. And it just, to me, reminds me, I even see a a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit here because the son of David in ages to come, the greater son of David, Jesus Christ, is also going to weep over Jerusalem, the very city that would crucify him. And it was Jesus who said, love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So this is the Old Testament version of that, and I see a foreshadowing of that in David's response. So he says in verse 14, How is it that you are not afraid to put forth your hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. And so David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Then David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah, the song of the bow. That's what this song that you and I are about to read was called, the song of the bow, probably because the bow of Jonathan is mentioned in the song. So it was called the song of the bow. And it says, indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. Now, have you read the book of Jasher? Anybody here read the book of Jasher? Yeah, I was just a trick question. We don't have it. Evidently, it existed. We know it existed prior to this because it's mentioned in Joshua chapter 10 after the sun stood still in the valley of Agilon. uh, When the hailstones came from heaven, that was recorded. So the book of Jasher would be the equivalent of our United States National Archives where you have the Soldiers of the different wars, especially notable soldiers and notable battles that are all recorded there uh, in the book of Jasher in poetic fashion. It was a book of poetry, uh, but, but again, it has not been preserved. It is just mentioned twice in the Bible, once in Joshua 10 and then once here. But here's the song. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. This is a reference to Saul and Jonathan and his brothers. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Now Gath was the capital city of the Philistines. Ashkelon was the place of central worship for the Philistines. So don't Put that in their local newspaper or on their radio stations that the Philistines have defeated Israel and that Saul has died. Don't tell it. Don't spread it around. Don't let anybody gloat over that, he is saying poetically. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor let there be rain upon you. Wow, he pronounces a curse on Mount Gilboa. No mountain dew. (laughs) Dr. Pepper's okay, apparently. That's not part of the curse. But no dew upon the mountains. Nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. A little bit of background, shields in those days were often made out of leather because leather exposed to the sun can crack. They would oil them. 
Uh, they would oil them not only to keep them from cracking, but also to make them slippery so as to deflect some weapon uh, that would come their way, swords and spears. Uh, the, the word picture here is that it's not anointed with oil like it should be. It is now doused and anointed with the blood of Saul and therefore rendered inoperable. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, there's the mention of the bow, did not turn back. Now, Jonathan was quite an archer. And he was not only good in battle, but David was especially thankful for the bow of Jonathan because it was a signal to David. Remember when David knew that Saul was against him and Jonathan didn't believe it? And Jonathan said, no, my dad isn't trying to kill you. No, he's really trying to kill me, dude. And Jonathan says, look, I'm going to go talk to dad. I think he just had a bad hair day, but let me have a talk to him. And uh, if it's true that he's trying to kill you, I'm going to shoot an arrow past you when you hide at that rock out in the field. If I shoot it in front of you and I tell one of my boys to go get the arrow and bring it back, um, then you know everything's okay. If it goes beyond you and I say, no, go beyond you, then you know you're right. He's trying to kill you. Get out of town. And so it was the use of the bow and arrow that gave that signal to David that saved his life. Besides being a, an incredible archer, he's thankful for the sword of Jonathan, or the bow of Jonathan, uh, did not turn back. And the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Before we get into Jonathan and the relationship he had with David in this beautiful poem, I did not mention yet that in verse 21, that curse upon Mount Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor let there be rain upon you. If you were to go to Israel today, and I invite you to do that, we will point out Mount Gilboa where all this took place. But you'll notice something pretty amazing. And the tour guides will be quick to point out the vast reforestation efforts that have gone on in that country since 1948, since the Jewish nation came back into the land. And what I mean by vast reforestation is that they have planted hundreds of millions of trees in the country of Israel. You'll, you'll drive in the tour buses past these mountains packed with pine trees, packed with eucalyptus trees, packed with all these different kinds of trees. You go, wow, this place is lush. And they will say, before 1948, it was barren. This has all been planted, each tree by hand, by Israelis, hundreds of millions of them. They have made their own forests since 50 years ago. We could do that here if we wanted to, if we were, um, we were uh, predisposed to doing it. So effectively, they have, rec they have um, examined the, the uh, weather of Israel in the last 70 years, and they have noticed that the rainfall has increased because of those reforestation efforts. So they have been successful in changing weather patterns in their own country by planting trees. So back to Mount Gilboa. Mount Gilboa is a mountainous region, lush forests, but there is a section that is completely barren. And the tour guides will say, according to the government, there's a, a section called Saul's shoulder on the shoulder of the mountain that they want to leave barren because of what, di what is written in that song by David. So to this day, it bears testimony that nothing grows there. It's barren, and uh, uh, they get rainfall, but uh, if it weren't planted by hand, nothing would grow on it. 
So it's just an interesting kind of a sideline, no extra charge, just wanted to throw that in. Okay, so, so back to a verse 25, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain under high places. I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. We live in a, a day and age in which there's lots of sexual tension. And the nation has never been more divided on certain issues, uh, including guns and gun control, including, including abortion, and including uh, gay rights. For years now, but it's increased in the writings recently, members of the LGBTQ community are quick to seize on this particular verse of scripture and write articles and include it in their books and they, they try to point out that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship. That it's an instance of um, homoeroticism in the biblical text because it says, your love was pleasant to me. It was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Now, when they write these articles, and by the way, it's not just people in that community, certain members of certain churches, the Methodist church takes that stand as well, or large sections of it. When they write these articles, they completely disregard context and historical context. Who had David been married to? Jonathan's sister, Michael, Michal. It was a bad marriage from the get-go. She spurned his advances, she protested him, she didn't love him, and David married her because he won her in a contest right? It, not that he wanted to win the contest for that reason, but it was something Saul, the father of the daughter, said, whoever wins this battle, then I'm going to give my daughter in marriage. David did that, and so you know it's a bad relationship when it starts out, I won my wife in a contest. <laughs> it's downhill after that, and it was downhill after that. So considering who he had been married to, this makes perfect sense. Compared to that relationship, Jonathan and David had a very close relationship. It says their soul was knit together. To make that a homosexual relation is unfair to the text itself. It is not fair. It's not found in the biblical text. You have to really read stuff into that to stretch out that application because it was never understood that way. Something else. Do you know that when soldiers fight together in battles like David and Jonathan, something happens that really unites them? In fact, studies have been done in our time where they have taken soldiers in battalions, off battlefields, integrating them back home into their families, and at a certain point, the soldiers will say, I feel much closer to my soldier families than my real family. I trust the soldier more than I trust my wife or my children or my parents. There is such a bond that is forged during wartime that this is perfectly, if, if you have a background in the military, you get this. But to read into this a, a, a homoerotic relationship is pretty blasphemous, does disservice to the biblical text, and it is completely inaccurate. Now, having said that, um, I will say this, though David was successful as a shepherd, successful as an envoy to Saul, successful as a general to Saul, successful as the king of Israel, 
He was a miserable failure in relationships. And the book of 2 Samuel, the whole last part, is devoted to the failures of the man. I would say there are three words that sum up the book of Samuel. Triumphs. That's number one. Chapter 1 through 10 are about David's triumphs. Second word, transgression. Chapter 11 and 12, David's transgression. Bathsheba, killing Uriah, etc. There's a few different things going on. And then the rest of the book, from chapter 13 to chapter 24, it's all about the troubles of David. And almost all of them are his sons or his uh, daughter who has been raped and uh, just the, the estrangement. And it's a me- he was an absolute abject failure when it comes to family relationships. Ne- needed to be said because... That's the record. So he closes it out saying, how the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war perish. He's mourning, he's crying, he ripped his clothes. It was a time of national mourning. But then in chapter 2, verse 1, it happened after that. David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, where shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, To everything there is a purpose, a time for every season under heaven. Time to mourn, a time to dance. Time to be born, a time to die. David's time to mourn was chapter 1. He truly did miss Jonathan. He truly did miss the sons of Saul. And he even missed, to some degree, King Saul. But there also comes a period of time when mourning is over and life must go on. It's unhealthy when mourning continues for years and years and years and a person is swallowed up by that. And I say that from personal experience. I watched my own mother after her son died, my brother died, just it ate her alive so much that she... Um, took all of the photographs of my brother out of the house, out of the family album. I took all of his belongings out. She wanted no reminder of him. And it was a dear aunt who came and visited us and said, "Um, Agnes, where's Bob? You need to put reminders of your son Oh, it's too difficult. You need to work past the difficult point and release him, but do this service to yourself and your family by having reminders of him in your house and honor him. It was the best thing that happened to her. She was able to grieve differently by going through it, not around it. So the nation went through it. David went through it, but now it's time to move on and be king. And so it happened after this. David inquired of the Lord, and I love this about David. He's asking God, finally. You know, for 16 months he had been in Philistine country. Never once is it recorded that he asked God for direction. Okay, been there, done that. That didn't work out. Now he's back to where he should be. Lord, he asked him the question, shall I go up to the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. Well, that wasn't good enough for David because David didn't know where to go up. And instead of just going up, he's a little bit cautious, so he asked the Lord again, where shall I go up? And he, the Lord said, go to Hebron. Hebron is in Judah. It's familiar territory to David. David was from Bethlehem. It's not too far from there. Hebron is about 20 miles south southwest of Jerusalem, and topographically it is higher in elevation than Jerusalem. It's about 3,400 feet in elevation. It's the highest city in Judah, topographically speaking. Uh, It was the area, do you remember in the book of Numbers when the 12 spies were sent into the land under Moses, and the spies went to a valley called the Valley of Eshkol, and they got grapes that were so massive and so many that it took two men to carry them on a pole between them and they came back to the camp of Israel. That was the area of Hebron, beautiful area. Today it's a Palestinian city, largely. There are some Jewish people that live there, but um, 
that's where he went. So he's learned the value of waiting on the Lord, gets God's directions, and it says in verse 2, So David went up there, and his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, and David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household, so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. We read this, and some of us ask the question, did God approve of David having two wives? Well, hold your horse. He's going to have a total of six. He had Michal, Michael, dumped her uh, after he got her back. She married off to somebody else, but he's got two wives. So question is, did God approve it? Answer is no. God didn't want this. That was never God's design or intention. Um, I know that for two reasons. One is the book of Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, singular. And the two, man and wife, shall be one flesh. It's pretty clear right there that one plus one equals two. They're one flesh. And he didn't say... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wives because that's not two anymore. Now it's three or four, or in David's case, seven. That's reason number one. I know it wasn't God's will and he didn't approve it. Reason number two, in Deuteronomy 17, it says, when you get into the land and you get tired of having me rule over you, the Lord said, you're going to ask for a king. And when you ask for a king, he is not to multiply wives to himself. He's not to have many wives. So David is already in error. You go, well, why is that in the Bible? Because the Bible is giving you an accurate record of what happened. That's all it is. There's a difference between narrative and instruction, or in the New Testament case, epistolatory literature. When you read, like the Old Testament, you're reading what actually happened. When you read epistolatory literature in the New Testament, like we are in Colossians, you're reading what should happen. We're reading what did happen, not what should happen. He is violating and will violate God on a number of issues. So here he has two wives. And uh, um, th th there's another reason why it's not good. One is enough. Am I right? Why are you laughing? Is what, one's enough. One husband is enough, right, women? One, did you, are, are you not fudging on me, are you here? I thought a few of you went, well. Now Solomon's going to go bonkers. He'll have 700 wives and 300 porky, I mean concubines. <laughs> So he brought them, went to Hebron. The men of Judah came there and anointed David king over the house of Judah. And David, they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. This is David's second anointing. His first anointing was private, the prophet Samuel in the house of Jesse. Second anointing is here. It is the anointing of David as king over one tribe, the tribe of Judah, his tribe, at Hebron for seven and a half years. He's age 30, and then in seven and a half years from this point, he will be anointed king over the entire nation. That will be the second public anointing, but here is the, the um, second anointing, but first public anointing. So David, uh, verse 5, let's continue our story, sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, you are blessed of the Lord for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I will repay this kindness because you have done this thing. Now therefore, let your hands be strengthened, be valiant for your master Saul is dead and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Remember the story? Saul fell dead on Mount Gilboa. Philistines cut his head off. They put his body on the walls of Bet-Shean. 
The men of Jabesh Gilead found out. They, by night, crossed over the Jordan, went to Jabesh Gilead, took his body off the wall, took it back home to Jabesh Gilead, gave him a decent burial. And why would they do that? Why would they travel over the Jordan in the middle of the night in a different territory and do that to Saul? Anybody know why? Because, I'll remind you of this, and you go, oh yeah, because the very first thing Saul did when he was king of Israel is rescue the men of Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites. Remember King Nahash came with the Ammonite army and said to the men of Jabesh Gilead, make a treaty with us. We're going to put out your, poke out your right eye and uh, you're going to be our slaves. Uh, we'll be back in a few days and you can sign a treaty. If you don't want to sign the treaty, we'll kill you. So you're either going to die or you're going to lose an eye and be my slave. And so the men of Jabesh Gilead said, uh, yeah, can we pray about that? You know, can we just wait a few days? We'll give you an answer. So they got word to Saul. Saul found out about it, took his army immediately, and delivered them from Nahash and the Ammonites. So he showed kindness right out of the chute, day one. And so they remembered that, and they are repaying that kindness. David said, I, at some point in the future, am going to repay your kindness because of what you did to the Lord's anointed. Verse 8, but Abner, the son of Ner, not the son of Nerd, the son of Ner, Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, which is east of the Jordan River, oh, a few miles, about 10 miles on the river Jabbok, made him king over Gilead over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, over all of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. In the time of David, that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now you might be thinking, now wait a minute, didn't you just say that Saul and his sons were killed on Mount Gilboa? Yep, three of his sons were. Jonathan, Abinadab, Malchishua, and their dad Saul all died on Mount Gilboa in that battle. Ishbosheth was some, son number four. He's next in line. By the rules of dynastic succession, he would take the throne. As soon as David announces up north that he is the king down south, Abner makes a move to take Saul's son and instill him as king. Now there's a civil war between north and south, which is interesting because um, the nation has deteriorated. It was united under King Saul. It will be united under David, but there's a brief period of north and south civil war. After David comes Solomon. After Solomon, the nation splits again, north and south. Jeroboam up north, Rehoboam down south. So there's this interesting dance historically between north and south, between the Hatfields and the McCoys. And it is part of their history. And even before the reunited monarchy, it happens again. So for seven and a half years, there's going to be a civil war. So Ishbosheth was not fighting in the battle. We don't know why. Maybe he was scared, or we don't know. But that's not, it, that's not really interesting. What's interesting to me, it says Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, he survived the battle on Mount Gilboa. Why? Because his job as the commander was to be Saul's bodyguard. He's unscathed. I don't know if he could just sort of read the tea leaves. You know, the Philistines are upon us. They're going to kill us, so I'm just going to march that way. But for some odd reason, and I think nefarious reasons, maybe I'm reading into it, he's alive, and he did not protect his master Saul. So, the civil war develops. David is king down south. David is not the king of the nation. 
And here's another thing I love about David. David, though anointed by the prophet as the next king of the nation, is willing to wait. He was willing to wait when Saul made him a fugitive, not killing Saul, not retaliating. He's the Lord's anointed. Here, not asserting his rights, but being patient. The Lord's timing, the Lord's timing, the Lord's timing. So different than most politicians. <laughs> We've done pretty good in terms of covering not just chapter one, but half of chapter two. I really want to finish chapter two, but that's not going to happen. So let me close with this thought. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, might be Psalm 75, promotion does not come from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Promotion comes from the Lord. And maybe you have been seeking a promotion where you're at. You want more people to notice you. You feel like you've got things to offer, and you probably do. David did. God already promoted him, but he wanted God to promote him in real time, and he was willing to wait till God made that happen. Are you willing to let God make that happen? It's just a good check for us who think that we deserve more or a better position or more notoriety or more notice. In the New Testament, Paul uses the analogy of the body of Christ and says every single part of the body, even those comely parts that you don't see, are vital and important. And some of those parts of your body need to be hidden. If suddenly your lungs demanded more exposure, I'm tired of being down here under this shirt and under this flesh and under these ribs. I want people to notice me. That would be the end of your body. You would die of an infection. So every part of the body of Christ is vital and important, but allow the Lord in his timing to raise you up, put others down, put you down. Just he's in charge. Let him be in charge. So, Father, we want to just close tonight with those thoughts. David was far from perfect. We read about his many wives. We read about um, his sense of revenge in some cases. These are things that actually happened, some of which perhaps shouldn't have happened, but they did. And yet in all that, he was a man after your own heart, a man after your own purposes. And I pray that likewise, we who are also imperfect and full of failures would just allow you in your timing to raise us up. And until then, Lord, prepare us. Prepare us for that move. Prepare us. Help us to be ready in season and out of season. Thank you, Lord, for faithful men and faithful women, a part of this study, those who are joining us online from different parts of the world. Strengthen them, all the home groups that meet around the study of Wednesday nights. Bless them, anoint them. And as we go from here, would you go before us, Lord, fighting our battles? In Jesus' name. Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.